Okay, so this week we're going to talk about mitosis and meiosis. Now, both of these are processes of cell division. So every cell that exists today came from another cell. Cells don't just spontaneously form. So to create more cells, we need to be able to divide our cells. Now, both of these will result in new cells. However, the outcome is a little different. So with mitosis, what we're going to do here is copy the parent cell. So the new cell that is created is going to be exactly the same as the parent. And you usually see this process wherever there is growth occurring, where you just want more of the same type of cell. Now, comparing that to meiosis, meiosis, we're actually going to cut the DNA in half. So we only have half as much DNA in the cells that are created through meiosis. So you usually see meiosis when you're making gametes. So with gametes in humans, we're talking about sperm and egg there. So sperm only has half the DNA of the parent cell, and an egg only has half the DNA of the parent cell it came from. So when a sperm and egg join together, they have the normal amount of DNA that we started with. So just in general, mitosis, again, is copying the cell, and you're usually going to use this in growth. Well, meiosis, you're not copying the cell, and you're create, going from a diploid to a haploid stage to create gametes. So meiosis, you're creating gametes, which is sperm and egg, so fertilization can occur. So we're going to go through the steps of each one of these. Okay, but before we can do that, we do need to go through a little background on how DNA stores genes. All right, so when we're talking about DNA, we're talking about a macromolecule. And if you remember from macromolecules, the monomer is the repeating subunit of those macromolecules. Well, the monomer in DNA is called nucleotides. So let's say each one of these colored pieces is representing some molecule, some monomer that can be repeated. Now there's four types of nucleotides. So here they're just color coordinated. Let's say there's blue, red, green, and yellow. Now these nucleotides are similar enough where they can chain together, as you can see here, but there's slight differences between the four. Now the order of these nucleotides is what's going to code for different proteins. So based on the order or the sequence of these nucleotides, different proteins are gonna be made from them. And different proteins will create different traits in the organisms. So this is where genetic variation is coming from. It's all based on the sequence of these nucleotides. So again, different sequences make different proteins, which creates different traits. Now DNA always comes in two strands. So we usually have a leading strand and a complement strand, or complementary strand. So we say DNA is double-stranded. And it's not in a straight line like this. They actually fold in a helix formation. So that's where the term double helix is coming from because we have two strands that are forming in the spiraling pattern. Okay, so this is just getting smaller just for this demonstration, but we can have trillions of these nucleotides in a cell. And so we need to be able to store them. And these chains can get very long. Some of these DNA strands in these cells, especially in humans, could be between 50 to 250 million nucleotides long. So that's a very big molecule that we need to fit in the cell. So we usually condense this DNA, and we do that around these proteins called histones. So a histone is a protein that wraps DNA. So DNA will wrap around these histones just to condense it. And we can condense it even further because these histones can then wrap around each other. And when we do that, we condense these histones into what we call chromosomes. So when you're looking at a chromosome, you're actually looking at a very, very long strand of DNA that has been condensed around histones and those histones condensed around themselves. So you can just imagine how many nucleotides are inside one of these chromosomes. And whenever you see a chromosome, it's usually expressed in this X formation. And we're gonna talk about that. That has to do with mitosis and meiosis, why we see it this way. But right here, this is just one long strand of DNA and what you're going to see in a little bit, that this is a, the exact same strand, just a copy of it. But again, in humans, one chromosome can be between 50 to 250 million nucleotides long. So we need to be able to condense these long strands of DNA into these chromosomes. Okay, so for this lecture, we're really just going to focus on humans' genome or how many chromosomes humans have. But every organism could be a little different. And with humans, we are diploid, which means we have pairs of chromosomes. So we're just going to talk a little bit right here about what we mean by pairs of chromosomes. So humans actually have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each one of our cells. So each cell actually has 46 chromosomes total. Okay, but why do we consider them pairs of chromosomes? Well, if you remember, one chromosome is a very, very long strand of DNA. 
and the sequence of the nucleotide of that DNA is going to code for different genes in the body. Well, let's take this first pair as an example. If we look at one section of this chromosome, we're going to find a sequence of nucleotides in the DNA that's coding for a gene. If we looked at the other pair or the other half of this pair of chromosomes, you're going to find the same gene at the same location. So we call these location loci. Loci is just this part of the chromosome where you're going to find a gene. And now they come in pairs, so you actually have two copies of the same gene. So if this is a gene, let's say this gene is hair color. So at this half of the pair of chromosomes, you're going to find a sequence for hair color. And on the same part of the chromosome of the other pair, you're going to find the gene for hair color. Now, even though the same gene is found in the same location or the same loci of this pair of chromosomes, it doesn't have to be the same sequence. So there could be a slightly different sequence in this chromosome versus this chromosome at the location for hair color. And this is what gives us variation in our hair color. So this chromosome could be coding for brunette hair, while this chromosome could be coding for blonde hair. The sequences are going to be slightly different, and you're going to have different results because of them, but they're both coding for hair color. So it's still the same gene, it's just different alleles of the same gene. So the same is true for all 23 pairs of chromosomes that we have in our cells. If you look at any loci, you're going to find a gene, and the same gene is going to be co coded in both the loci of the pair of chromosomes, but sequences could be different. However, sequences could be the same too. So going back to this loci, we could be coding, we could have the same sequence here and here. That's totally a possibility. It could be brunette and brunette hair, but sometimes it could be different. Now, which one of these are going to be expressed is a topic for a different time. So we're going to talk about that next time, actually. But just keep in mind that we have two copies of any gene in each one of our cells. And that these genes are coded by DNA that are condensed into chromosomes. And these chromosomes come in pairs. And we have 23 of them. And the 23rd chromosome pair is actually called the sex chromosomes. And that's really determining our genetic sex. So we could either have an XX, which is two very long chromosomes, or we could have an XY, which is a normal size chromosome and then a short chromosome. So if you have this Y or short chromosome, that is what's going to make you a genetic male. However, you have a normal size and normal size chromosome next to each other at the 23rd pair, you're going to be a genetic female. Okay, but where did these chromosomes come from? Well, like we said at the beginning here, under meiosis, we create haploid cells, which means each of the gametes are only going to have half of this pair of chromosomes. And then when the gametes come together and fertilize each other, that is when you create a new organism, or you come back to this diploid stage that we're seeing here. And again, diploid just meaning pairs of chromosomes. So in any cell, half the genes that they have came from the sperm, while the other half came from the egg. So for each one of these pairs of chromosomes, one of them came from dad, while the other one came from mom. So one of this pair of chromosomes, or half of this pair of chromosomes, came from the sperm of the father, while the other half came from the egg of the mother. And the same thing can happen for all 23 pairs. So one of them came from mom, while the other one came from dad. And there's no particular order. It doesn't have to be dad that is the first of the pair of chromosomes and mom is the second. It could be either way. This is irrelevant to cells. We're just doing this here just to make it clear for demonstration purposes only. Okay, so we're about to go through the steps of mitosis and meiosis. But knowing what you know already just from what we talked about in the beginning of this video, what is going to be the result of this DNA in mitosis versus the result of this DNA in meiosis? Well, if you remember, mitosis, you're copying the parent cell. So whenever this cell is going to divide, it is going to have exact copies of the DNA as well. So you're just going to end up with the same thing. So we call these parent cells, which is the cell that we started with, and then daughter cells are the ones that come from it. So genetically, the daughter cell is going to be identical to the parent cell through mitosis. Now comparing that to meiosis, we're going to split the pair of chromosomes when we're creating the new cell. So again, we're going to have a parent cell that is diploid, has pairs of chromosomes, but the gamete that is going to be made is going to be haploid, meaning it's only going to have half of that pair for each of the pairs of chromosomes. And what we're going to see when we go through meiosis is which part of the pair makes it to the gamete does not matter. It is completely random. So for this first pair, it just happened that the male or the father's chromosome made it to this gamete. 
Well, in this pair of chromosomes, the mother's chromosome happened to make it to the gamete. All right, so just to recap this again, so with this parent cell, it has pairs of chromosomes. Half came from the sperm, while half came from the egg that created this organism. And this diploid organism cell is going to split into a gamete that's going to be haploid and only have one of the two chromosomes from the pair. And which one of those two chromosomes make it to the gamete is completely random. You have a 50-50 chance for either of these chromosomes to make it to the gamete for that pair of chromosomes. So at the end of meiosis, you're going to end up with 23 chromosomes total in a gamete from the 46 chromosomes total from the parent cell that divided to make this gamete. Okay, so we're going to first go over mitosis. And if you remember with mitosis, what we're going to do here is have an identical cell to the parent cell. So the parent cell, again, if this is the DNA of the parent cell, you're going to create a daughter cells that have the same DNA as that parent cell did. So we're going to go through each one of these steps and see how that happens. But before we do that, let's take a look at the cell cycle. Because mitosis is actually a very small part of the cell cycle. All right, so down here is the cell cycle. And you can see mitosis, again, is a very small part of it. So really, the cell spends most of its time in something called interphase. And interphase is broken up into three parts. It's broken up into G1, S, and G2. So in the G1 stage is when the cell is growing and getting larger. And we also see a lot of the other organelles and other parts of the cell duplicate in G1. The only thing that is not duplicating here is the DNA. That happens in S phase. So S phase is when DNA duplicates. So when the DNA is duplicated, this is what it creates. So now we have copies of each of the pair of chromosomes for all 23 pairs in this genome. So you can see here with this chromosome, you have two copies of this chromosome, two exact copies. And we have a term for these. We call these sister chromatids. And these sister chromatids are going to be held together by a protein complex called a centromere. Okay, so if sister chromatids are two exact copies of each other, what are the two chromosomes called that have the same genes but not necessarily have the same sequence of DNA? Well, we call these two chromosomes in a pair homologous chromosomes or homologous pair. So just to clarify with this pair of chromosomes, you have two sister chromatids that have the exact same sequences of DNA and two sister chromatids with the same sequence of DNA over, over here. And then you have homologous chromosomes that code for the same genes. So before we got into S phase, we had 46 chromosomes total, two for each of the pairs. And then after S phase, we actually have 92 chromosomes total, since we have four chromosomes for each of the pairs now of homologous chromosomes. All right, then after S phase, we get into G2 of interphase, and here DNA is just being repaired, and more proteins are being made to prepare for mitosis to occur. After G2, then we get into mitosis, which is a very quick process. And we're going to go through the steps of mitosis here in a second. And then we have cytokinesis, where the two cells split apart. And then each of those cells can undergo the same process again. But it is important to know where the DNA replication is happening here and how many chromosomes we have before and then after that S phase. Okay, so the first phase of mitosis is called prophase. And there are a few things that are happening here. All right, so in prophase, that first phase of mitosis, we have the nuclear envelope start to deteriorate. So the nuclear envelope is the membrane that is surrounding the nucleus. So that starts to break down. So another thing that's happening during prophase is that the chromosomes are starting to condense. So I know we've been drawing them out as this X formation this whole time. That just makes it easier for us to diagram it. But in reality, before mitosis begins, all this DNA is unraveled and looks like a bowl of spaghetti. So during prophase, it really condenses and really tightens around those histones to create these chromosomes. Also during prophase, we have something called a spindle apparatus that is formed and starts moving towards the poles of the cell. So these spindle apparatuses are made up of two parts. So we have the centrioles, which are these organelles right here. And then we have microtubules that branch off from the centrioles. So these microtubules are going to grow outwards from the centriole and connect to each one of these sister chromatids. 
and they connect at something called a kinetochore, which is another protein complex of the centromere. And remember, the centromere is the protein complex that holds the two sister chromatids together, while the kinetochore is the protein complex that connects to the microtubules that are coming off of these centrioles. So again, those are the two parts of the spindle apparatus, is the microtubules and the centrioles. All right, after prophase is completed, then we get into metaphase. And during metaphase of mitosis, we have our homologous chromosomes actually line up in a line just like this. And when this happens, we call this a metaphase plate, this line of chromosomes as they're lined up. So you can see that these are a homologous pair, and you have a sister chromatid on each side of the cell. We also have our microtubules connecting to the kinetochores of these sister chromatids. And we also have microtubules that meet each other in the middle of the cell. Now these microtubules that are touching each other are actually going to help split the cell apart by pushing against each other. So we have these microtubules that are pushing against each other and they're gonna start causing the cell to split outwards or push itself outwards. And as it does that, it's gonna drag each one of these sister chromatids to each side of the cell. All right, next we get into anaphase. And what is happening during anaphase is that the spindle fibers are pushing against each other through these microtubules, elongating the cell, but it's also dragging each one of the sister chromatids to each side of the cell. Now remember, the sister chromatids are exact copies of each other. So you have one copy of one homolog going this way and the same copy going to the other side. Here's that other homolog of the first pair going this way and another copy of it going to the other side as well. So you can see exact copies are being moved to each side of the cell. And these chromatids are being dragged by their kinetochores, which is more towards the center of these chromosomes. And it creates this dragging appearance where it's being pulled by the center and the arms are being dragged behind it. And then we get into telophase. So after anaphase comes telophase. And what's going on in telophase is the chromosomes have made it to the poles of the cell. They're not being dragged anymore. The nuclear envelope starts developing on each side. So now you have two new nuclei. And the microtubules that were attached or pushing against each other continue to do so, splitting the cell even further. Okay, so once telophase is finished, we now have our nucleus for each of the new cells that are being formed. And we start to see something called a cleavage furrow, which is the plasma membrane of the cell being pinched inwards as the two cells are about to be pulled apart. All right, then after cytokinesis, you're left with two daughter cells that have the same DNA. Just like we have a copy of one chromosome right here, we have the same copy in this cell. We have this copy of the chromosome here, we have the same copy in this cell. And then we have the same pairs of chromosomes that we had in that parent cell. So once this is finished, each one of these cells can then go through that cycle again. So first they would go through S phase where they duplicate their DNA and their chromosomes, making sister chromatids, and then go through meiosis where the DNA is split apart. So the result of mitosis after one round of mitosis is two daughter cells that are identical genetically. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about meiosis and things happen a little differently in meiosis. And as a result, we end up with different types of daughter cells. Now remember, meiosis is when you're really making gametes. That's when you're going to see meiosis. So we're going to go from these diploid cells, these diploid parent cells, to haploid gametes. All right. And so if this was the parent cell right here, this is the new gamete that was made from it. And if you notice, we have a diploid parent, meaning we have two to the pair of each of the chromosome pairs. And in the gamete, we only have one of those pairs in the cell. So these are haploid now. And which of these pair of chromosomes make it to the gamete is random. All right, you have a 50-50 chance of either getting the blue one here or the pink one here for this first pair of chromosomes. All right, so we're going to go through the steps of meiosis and just to see how this occurs. Um, in a lot of ways, meiosis is very similar to mitosis. So we do have an interface with meiosis. The cell does prepare for division. It does replicate the DNA during S phase, just like we saw in mitosis. So I'm not going to go through that again. But just keep in mind, it went through S phase, and all of these chromosomes are going to be duplicated into sister chromatids, just like we saw in mitosis. 
Okay, something else that is different in meiosis than mitosis is that meiosis actually has two cycles. So mitosis has one cycle and then you end up with two cells. Meiosis actually has two cycles and the result is four cells at the end. So as we go through each one of these phases, keep in mind which cycle are we in? Are we in the first cycle or the second cycle? So we're starting with the first cycle first and the first phase of the first cycle is prophase one. And just like in mitosis, in prophase one, you're going to have the nuclear envelope deteriorate. You have the chromosomes condense. You have your spindle fibers moving towards the poles. And you have your microtubules connecting to the kinetochores of the chromosomes. All right, something else that happens in prophase one is something called crossover. And with crossover, what we do is create a protein complex between a sister chromatid of one homologous pair, one of the homologs of the homologous pair, and a sister chromatid of the other homolog of the homologous pair. Now this protein complex has a name, it's called a chiasmata. And what happens at the chiasmata is that these chromosomes, even though they're part of the same pair and have the same genes, they have different sequences of those genes on each one of these chromosomes, and they will actually switch their DNA. So here we had just a little bit of this blue chromosome make it onto this pink chromosome here, and a little bit of the pink chromosome make it onto this blue chromosome here. All right, this is helping increase genetic diversity during gamete formation. So now with the sister chromatids for this pair of chromosomes, these two sister chromatids are not identical anymore. All of this part of the chromosome might be the same sequence, but now down here we have different sequences for the sister chromatids. And same thing with these two. Down here, it's going to be slightly different. All right, so that is crossover, and this happens during prophase one of meiosis. Okay, so the next major difference from mitosis and meiosis comes with metaphase one. All right, during metaphase one, the homologous pairs line up on the metaphase plate. And this is different than mitosis, because if you remember with mitosis, it was the sister chromatids that lined up on the plate. And the homologous pair were actually in line with each other. So the homologous pair were in a line going straight down. Well, here the homologous pair are side by side with each other. So before with mitosis, we had these sister chromatids being pulled apart. But now with meiosis, we actually have the homologs or homologous pair be pulled apart. Now, one important thing to mention with this metaphase one, as these homologous pairs line up on the metaphase plate, which one is on the left side and which one's on the right side is irrelevant. All right, you have a 50-50 chance of getting the pink ones on the left side and the blue ones on the right side, or these could be flipped compared to the chromosome pair below. So you might get the blue ones on the left side and the pink ones on the right side. So the fact that, so the fact that these pair of chromosomes, how they line up on the metaphase plate in meiosis one is independent from how these pair line up or these pair line up or all 23 pairs line up is called the law of independent assortment. This is important because every time you create gametes, every time you have a meiosis event, you could have very different outcomes on which chromosomes make it to the same cell. So in this event, we're going to have pink, blue, pink on this side of this division, but we could have just as easily had pink, blue, blue over here, or blue, pink, pink. And there's just endless possibilities of combinations that could make it to this side of the cell and this side of the cell. And this creates even more genetic diversity when we are making our gametes. Then we get to anaphase one. You could see that the homologous pairs are being separated. So this pair, these two sister chromatids are being dragged this way while these two are being dragged this way. Same thing here and same thing here. All right, then after interphase one, we get to telophase one, and you can see that we have sister chromatids here and sister chromatids here, but half of the pair is on this in this cell and half of the pair is in this cell. So these cells are actually haploid now. The pairs of chromosomes are not together anymore in the cell, so we consider that haploid. All right, and after telophase one, we actually split the cells just like we would see in mitosis, and the result is two haploid cells. But meiosis isn't done yet. This is just the first cycle of meiosis. 
Now we get into the second cycle of meiosis. Okay, so after telophase one is finished, we get into prophase two. And in prophase two, just like in prophase one, we have our spindle fibers form and move to the poles of the cell. We have our DNA condense again in these haploid cells. And we again, we have a microtubules that form and connect to kinetic cores of these chromosomes. All right, and then we get into metaphase two. And just like in mitosis, in, in metaphase two of meiosis, these sister chromatids are what's going to line up on the metaphase plate. So now when separation occurs, we have the copies of each other being pulled to each side of the cell. All right, after metaphase two, we get into anaphase two. And again, you see the sister chromatids being dragged to each side of the cell with their arms being dragged behind them, so being pulled by the center at the kinetochore. And then we have telophase two, where the nuclear envelope reforms around this DNA, all these chromosomes, and cytokinesis occurs, where you have the cleavage furrow, and then eventually the separation of the cells. And look what we end up with after our two rounds of meiosis. So when meiosis is done, after meiosis one and two are finished, what we end up with is four cells that are all genetically different from one another. So each one of these cells are haploid. And as you can see, they only have one of the chromosomes for the pair that makes them haploid. And no two are identical. Well, this one and this one might be close to being identical since they have the same sequence for chromosome one and chromosome one and chromosome 23 and chromosome 23. But because of that crossover event that happened in prophase one, the second chromosome is different than the second chromosome of this cell. So we have some genetic variation here. And the same thing with these two cells. All right, so de depending if we're talking about a male or a female, these gametes are either going to become sperm or an egg. But now they're haploid. When did they become diploid again like humans are supposed to be? Well, that happens when a haploid sperm meets a haploid egg. These chromosomes will then combine again during fertilization to make a diploid cell. And you have successfully completed the sexual reproduction. So why is meiosis so different and why does it take all these extra steps? Steps is because we want genetic variation with reproduction. Genetic variation is very beneficial, especially in changing environments. So the more genetic variation we have in our offspring, the more likely we're gonna have an offspring that survives and passes on the genes. Okay, so tying this all together, just to compare mitosis to meiosis. So here with this mitosis, we have this parent cell. After mitosis is done, we end up with two identical daughter cells. All right, just looking at any of these pairs of chromosomes, you see with the parent, we had a blue and a red for this pair of chromosomes. And looking at the daughter cells, we have a blue and a red here and a blue and a red here. So they're identical. They have the same genes here as you do here. And that really is the point of mitosis. You're just duplicating or copying the cell. And that is why this is mostly used for growth because all you're doing is multiplying the same cells. And then these cells can multiply and so forth. And eventually you have enough cells to create some sort of tissue. Now comparing that to meiosis, here's our parent cell, just like we had the parent cell here in the mitosis, we had the same genes. But if you notice at the end of meiosis, we end up with four cells instead of two. All of these cells are haploid, all right? You see we only have one of the copies versus the two that we had in the parent. And that each one of these cells are genetically distinct. No two cells of the four that are created from this parent have the same genes. So there's variation or mixing up the genes going on here. And that's again because meiosis has a different purpose. Here you're creating gametes and the point of sexual reproduction is to create genetic variation. You want variation with your offspring because that increases the chances of one of your offspring surviving in a new environment. So with mitosis, 
only one round ends up with two cells that are genetically identical to the parent and to each other. And then meiosis, you have two cycles, and the result is four cells that are all haploid and genetically distinct. And if you really want to get to know these processes, I suggest that you go and draw all this out yourself. I really feel that drawing is one of the best ways to understand and learn biology because it helps you visualize these things that are going on at the cellular level that we cannot see with our naked eye. So I would take, it, so I would take some time, pull out a piece of paper, and draw each one of these steps for each one of these processes just to see what's different between the two and definitely understand why each one is used. Again, mitosis is mostly used for growth because you're dividing cells to be identical. And meiosis is used for reproduction because you're creating sperm and egg that are genetically distinct and haploid. All right, so that is everything that I wanted to cover in this video.